Every night, without fail, a small group gathers in historical Irvington to hear tales of its hallowed haunts. Al Hunter, who leads Irvington's ghost tours, is convinced it is an epicenter of haunting in the Indianapolis area. You know why we start our tours from here? You know what this building is that I'm leaning on? It's Irvington Masonic Lodge 6, 6, 6. And you can go right out to the front and look up at the top and see that it says Irvington Masonic Lodge 666. Part of his tour leads the curious past a small cottage nestled on a back street of this sleepy neighborhood. And it may not be so peaceful because it rests on the site of the 1894 murder of 10-year-old Howard Peitzel, the hands of the infamous and prolific serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. The 1893 Chicago World's Fair was the biggest thing that ever hit these shores. Uh, 28 million people attended that fair. That was over half the entire population of the country at the time. Uh, Holmes was a doctor. He went, he graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, he graduated in 1887, I believe it was. Uh, and he made his way to Chicago. Uh, found a place at 63rd and Wallace in a place called Inglewood. Uh, the bottom story were shops, top story were regular rooms, middle story were rooms that had no diagrams, no record of it. They had uh, doors that locked from the outside only, um, open gas valves in every, do in every room. Innocent young women flocked to Chicago to see the World's Fair attractions. And it was here Holmes lured them with the promise of cheap room and board. A grisly fate awaited them, though. Trapped in their rooms, Holmes often gassed them as he watched through a peephole and then experimented on their bodies to see how far they would stretch or sold their remains to universities for medical study. He confessed to 27 such murders, but the true number will never be known. Poor Howard's murder was born from a different scheme. Holmes and Howard's entire family were in on an insurance fraud scheme. Unbeknownst to the family though, Holmes planned to kill them all. Starting with Howard's father, P.F. Peitzel, allowing Holmes to keep all the money for himself. With the disappearance of their father, Holmes was entrusted with the care of three of the five Peitzel children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard. Traveling the Midwest with the children, Holmes awaited the perfect opportunity to dispose of these young witnesses to his swindle. Holmes rented a cottage in Irvington with the express purpose of doing away with Howard. But this was one murder that would not go unsolved. The charred remains of Howard Peitzel were found in a wood-burning stove on the property by Frank P. Geyer, an investigator with the Pinkerton Agency. Later, at the trial, a witness testified that Holmes had installed the stove himself with little Howard watching, unaware that it would be his final resting place. And when asked why he hadn't simply hooked into the cottage's existing gas line, Holmes replied, gas is dangerous around children. And so we've been here about 10 years, and um, when we, we, we knew nothing about the history of the house when we moved in, we, uh, we didn't know anything except that we were very drawn to the house. The whole family was in on this scam, see? The whole Peitzel family was in with Holmes because yes. what they were going to do is fake Benjamin Peitzel's death and they were going to split the insurance money with Holmes. Well, what they didn't know was that Holmes planned to kill all of them. He had this ruse going on where, yeah, 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 you know, everybody's fine and Ben's fine and the kids are fine, but he was like knocking them off, you know, one by one. And I think that he had planned to kill Howard actually in Cincinnati. Right. But when they came and they were staying in a circle um, hotel down on the, the circle, there are um, writings, I think, by his sisters, was mm -hmm. it? Where they are writing letters to their mom that ever, never actually made it to their mom um, because Holmes would intercept them. But later they were found and where she, they were talking about Howard was being really mischievous. I mean, he was just getting on Holmes' nerves. <laughs> And I just think Holmes couldn't take it anymore. He got out here, he found a cottage, he rented it, and murdered him. When the children would write letters back to their mother, 
they would use ciphers and code in case the letters were exposed. Their cipher for Holmes, 4, 18, 8, or when translated, D, R, H. Well, I think we could get some things outside because of where some things happened. But sometimes you get Um, I started noticing like my printer would just turn on and start printing gibberish and um, I would start having problems with my computer. Well, you just kind of chalk it up to like electrical issues, whatever, okay. even though we had just had the house rewired. The activity kind of, it continued and the, we would hear voices and together and with the um, windows closed, we would hear some voices and they were muffled and we realized that it wasn't anybody outside, it was somebody in the house, maybe sounded like they were in our closet. We started to get a little bit leery. Three of the Faisal siblings out of the five were with uh, Holmes. He stayed here temporarily. And he'd been in a circle for yeah. some reason in a hotel. He said he was surprised at his mother. We were talking about selling the house because we were getting very frightened. The activity started to pick up. All of a sudden, we'd go into the kitchen and all the drawers would be open. You could be standing in the kitchen with your back to the cabinets, and then when you turn around, everything's open. They had taken the three children all across the Midwest, stayed here temporarily, and then took the two girls up to Toronto, Canada. But I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear the front door just slamming. We're really going crazy here. Something's happening. There were a lot of nights that I didn't sleep. So our therapist recommended that we contact Marilyn Isaac. And there's places on the earth where there's more activity. And Irvington happens to be extremely active. And the next thing she said was, I got to get over there right away because you have a negative male spirit who is in the east side of your yard. You have two outbuildings on your property. And I said, no, we don't. You used to. And this very evil man spends his time in there. And he is he is on your property. <laughs> and I have to get over there. Right. Left the boy here. The girls didn't know what happened to their brother. And unfortunately, he met his untimely demise on this property. He said he was surprised at his Did they believe you? Believe you? Believe you? Believe you? Believe you? Believe you? I think it was that killing of the innocent. You know, when you—it's yeah. probably the worst sin there is to harm animal and children is the harming of the innocent. So I think his karma kind of came back to haunt him here. When I see him now, it's almost like even though he crossed over at 10, he almost looks to me like he's older, like he's grown in spirit. Is there anybody that wants to come forward and talk with us tonight? There was one night that um, I was completely awake. I just, I wasn't sleeping. The, the cat was jumping up and down on the bed. As soon as I pushed him down, I heard this voice right next to my face, and it was the, the worst, most terrifying voice I've ever heard. And it was this real deep kind of horrible, it was just a horrible voice. And it said, uh, look at him. here that knows Mr. Holmes? Any family members? Any victims? Howard, are you here? Did you uh, Howard's here. He's hiding. Yeah, he's hiding behind something.
I feeling with Howard. It's really interesting. Did did Holmes ever hurt you, Howard? Would he punish you frequently? Did he lock you in small spaces like closet? Or maybe stuff you in a trunk at any time just to punish you? Did you ever catch him hurting your sisters? Was there anything you tried to do to stop him? to keep him from hurting people, your sisters, or you. Do you feel like there's anybody out in the hallway? Do you feel like there's anybody out in the hallway? Do you feel like there's anybody out in the hallway? Yeah, he knew him as Dr. Holmes. Dr. Holmes. And he refer and he fed off of Howard. They because of the age that Howard was, it's kinda of like how poltergeist energy works with pubescent individuals there was like a conduit that Howard was for they fed off of each other's energy did you ever feel that Holmes was bad that he could hurt you at any time feel that uh, he did try to protect his sisters. I, I get a sense from what something he just showed me. It's kind of like a, he tried to deflect. It's like, a, okay, let's, let's be, let's do something bad over here so he doesn't do something to the girls. Let's do, let's redirect this. My gut feeling is it has to do with some things that they, that they found out there. It's just kind of a strange sensation. I've been feeling this around me this evening, and, or that he's just hanging here in the background somewhere. Would you like to look at the full moon? Sit outside and watch the moon at night. Say yes. It got loud. Something going on over there. The second time denied, it felt like somebody's clamped a hand close to the back of my neck. And once in the house and once out here. I just heard I think this maybe he made him that's just out of left field or right field over here I heard yeah but I mean it was loud Come on up, I'll show you something you won't ever see anywhere else but here. Don't be shy. That uh -huh. is Holmes's Michigan graduation program with his name as Herman Mudgett on the back. Mm -hmm. The envelope that they came in that's signed by H.W. Mudgett himself. And this is probably the most interesting thing. This is a picture of Holmes as a University of Michigan medical student. Holmes is to all the way over to my right, wearing his derby cap, 
And if you were to blow that up, you'd see the cadaver. You see the cadaver, the sorry looking cadaver on the table. If you were to blow that up, you would see that Holmes has taken the pocket knife out of his pocket, opened it and stabbed it into the wooden table. And he's got his fingers on the corpse and his hand behind his back as if to say, hurry up and take the picture so I can start cutting on this corpse. <laughs> This is only the second time I've ever brought it out, so... And how did I get these? When I started doing the tours eight years ago, Holmes came from New... Uh, Mudgett came from New Hampshire. His house still stands. Uh, I talked to his relatives, and they just wanted the stuff gone. We're grateful for this home. We're grateful for this hallowed ground that is now restored to its original purpose and intention, free from violence, free from negative energy, negative memories. We ask only that which is of the light to remain. We're grateful. H.H. Holmes was one of this country's most prolific murderers, a killing machine with no afterthought, except for who would be his next victim. He left him a cob trail of death through the Midwest, and they have never been caught if it hadn't been for the hard investigative work of Geyer. That the beginning of the end for Holmes was here in Irvington may have been luck or providence, but for whatever reasons, the voices are clear and still echo through the cool night air. Thank you.